Well, hi and welcome to our series for the Minor Prophet, Prophets as we're looking at Habakkuk and Haggai. Last week we finished looking up at Habakkuk and today we start our journey of two weeks in the book of Haggai. How about you pray as we come and look at what God's Word says. Our Father God, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for that Word that was written all those years ago is still relevant to us now. We pray as we think through Haggai uh, that through your Spirit you'll help us understand what you're saying to us today. Amen. Well, the year was 586 BC, and just as God had promised, the Babylonian army came in and destroyed Jerusalem. The city walls destroyed, the main buildings and, 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 and palaces destroyed, and God's temple destroyed. And nearly everyone who lived in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas were captured up by the Babylonians and taken back with them into exile. All that was left was a ruined city, a ruined temple, and the poorest of the poor, without the money or the resources to fix up the, the city. See, just as God promised through the, the prophet Habakkuk, Jerusalem was destroyed because of their rejection of God. But just as God's promise of the destruction of Jerusalem came true, the destruction of the Babylonian Empire happened as well. See, God promised that he would judge them justly and fairly because they had rejected him and treated people in the wrong way. So in, in 539 BC, the Persians, led by King Cyrus, came up and completely destroyed the Babylonians. The once powerful superpower of that region was completely destroyed. See, God's word came true. And see, just as God had told Habakkuk that Jerusalem would be destroyed and that the Babylonians themselves would face judgment, God had also told the prophet Isaiah that he, would, he himself would raise up King Cyrus. And King Cyrus would be the one to rebuild his city. See, unlike the Babylonians, the Persians had a different sort of policy when it came to foreign people. The Babylonians liked to capture people, take them into exile and separate them across the empire. But under Cyrus, the Persian plan was to get people together and send them back to their own homelands. The idea was that they'd be happy and that they'd submit to Persian rule. You see, it was the same for the Jews when Cyrus became king in 539 BC. See, Cyrus declared by the will of God that he was sending the Jews back to Jerusalem, not just to enjoy the freedom of living in their own country, but to rebuild the temple of God. To rebuild the temple of God. And in 537 BC, we know that the first lots of Jews returned to Jerusalem. And they were filled with hope. But they were also filled with, with, with the articles from the temple that had been taken away by the Babylonians. They were there to rebuild the temple. And, and to put those things that belonged to God back in God's temple. And if you were to go in, into the Old Testament, to the book of Ezra, we're told one of the first things that these Jews did in 537 when they got to Jerusalem was they rebuilt the altar to God. And they started laying their foundation to rebuild the temple. At that moment, things started to look up for God's people again. And things started to look up for God's special city, Jerusalem. But I want us to jump forward 17 years. And if you were to walk to the side of the temple, pretty much nothing had changed. For the temple, nothing had changed. That was a different story, though, for the rest of the city. See, businesses were booming. Houses and great, glorious, luxurious houses were being put up. But God's temple, God's house, still remained in ruins. And it's into this situation that God speaks to, this, uh, to his servant, the prophet Haggai. And God gives a word to Haggai to give to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, and to give to Joshua, the high priest of God's people. And this is what the word of the Lord says in Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you to yourselves to be living in panelled houses while this, ha while this house remains a ruin. See, God knew exactly what his people were thinking. See, they weren't overly fussed about the temple. They were pretty apathetic, really. It wasn't that they didn't have the resources or the time to rebuild God's temple. It's just they didn't have the will 
or the desire. When they first came back to Jerusalem, they were keen and they started, but, but then the opposition came. Those in the, in the areas around started to make trouble and tell the Persian rulers, stop these Jews from doing this. They're going to cause problem. And so the temple, God's house, their relationship with God had gone from something being at the forefront of their minds to an afterthought. Something they would only do if it was convenient for them. See, they'd made sure their own houses were beautiful. How God says through by God, you know, that their houses are paneled. What that means is, is their houses weren't just basic stone and brick, but then they were overlaid with wooden panels. That they were, they were built with every special part you could put to a house. They were luxurious. They had all the trimmings. But you see, there's the very same God that had saved their ancestors from Egypt. The very same God which had just brought them out of exile and brought them back into the land that he promised them was now playing second fiddle to their own wants, their own desires, and their own passion. But as we continue to listen to God's word through Haggai, we see that although they've been seeking their own pleasures, their own desires, their own wants, in the words of the Rolling Stones, they get no satisfaction. From verse 5, now this is what the Lord says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages, but you put them in purses with holes in them. And then if we continue reading verses 9 to 11, God explains why they haven't experienced the satisfaction they thought they would. This is what God says from verse 9. You expect much, but see it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Declares the Lord Almighty. Because my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house, therefore... Because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crop. I called you, I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produced, on people and livestock, and on all the labours of your hands. You see, the drought, their failing crops, their wanting, their experience of not having what they thought they should have had been sent by God because they had they'd failed God. They had ignored Him. They'd been apathetic to God and left His house a ruin. Now, now this isn't God being petty or, or nasty or vindictive. He's not going, I, I see that you've got beautiful houses and mine's not great. I see your houses are panelled and, and, and mine is ruined so I'm jealous so I'm, I'm going to do something bad to you. No, no, this, this is because they had a heart problem. You, you see, what the people of Jerusalem was doing was actually idolatry. Okay, just, just hear me out here. I know as we, we read through Haggai 1, there's, there's no mention of idols or fake gods or, or Baal, one of the, the gods they'd worshipped before. And, and if you would go to Ezra and Zechariah, which are, which are books which cover the same period in the history of the Jews, you won't see mentions of idols or of statues of Baals. But, but you see, at the heart, idolatry is whenever we put anything above God. And you see, what the people of Jerusalem were doing was they were putting their desires. They were putting their wants. They were putting their wealth above God. In fact, they had made those things their idols. You see, the temple of God wasn't just a religious building. A building he came in for religious ceremonies. And it wasn't just a house for God to live in because we know that, that nothing we make can contain God. But no, the temple was a symbol of God's presence with his people. It was a symbol that God was with his people. A symbol of the promised covenant he had with his people. But see, their own comfort, their own wealth, their own well-being had become an idol. And so they become apathetic to God. They've become apathetic to living with God with them. And this is why God's temple still lay in ruins. Because they had replaced God as the most important thing in their lives. And you see, this is why they're ha fa having failing crops. This is why they work but not feel the satisfaction. 
It was their sin of idolatry that was causing it. I just want to pause here for a minute and just have a quick, quick moment to think about sin and direct punishment. Sin and direct punishment. You see, here Haggai clearly tells us that they're failing crops. That their lack of, of sort of enjoyment of the things they were working at, but because of the drought they were receiving, was a direct result of their neglect of God. A direct result of a particular sin. You see, you see when, when, when the Jews came out of Egypt, when God brought them to the promised land, as they are about to enter it, He makes a covenant, which is a binding promise with them. And we read about it in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 11, we're told, we're told this. Deuteronomy 11, from verse 13. It's God speaking to the people. This is the promise that they make. So if you faithfully obey the commands I give you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart, with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land, so you may gather in your grain new wine and new olive. I will provide grass in the field for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Be careful, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you, and He will sh shut up the heavens, so that it will not rain, and the ground will yield no produce, and you will soon perish from the good land the Lord is giving you. See, Haggai here through God is reminding them that they're receiving drought because they've broken the promise with God. But, but we're not under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant, under the promise of Jesus when we trust in him. And the Bible is clear. If you should look at Luke 13, 1 to 5, or John 9, 1 to 5, that we can't always go, a direct consequence comes from a particular sin. We can't go, I did X, therefore this bad thing has happened to me. See, that, that's not a biblical concept. That's more a concept of karma. Unless God has clearly told us that a, a bad event or a negative thing has happened because of a particular sin, we know bad things happen because all of us in the world are sinful. Sin has infected our world, and so bad things happen. And that should make us think we need a saviour. We need someone to save us from these things. And we know that in Jesus, he died and he took that punishment. But whether we face direct uh, punishment for our sin or we just, we just notice the impacts of sin on our world and it leads us to, to contemplate our own sin, what we do know is we need to repent. We need to turn away from sin and turn back to God. We need to say sorry to God for the times we've gone against him. And that's the same for us today as it was for Haggai's people back then. And that's what Haggai was called by God to do. To tell them that you are facing these things because you have neglected me. Repent. And for Haggai and the people in those days, what repentance meant for them was to get off their backsides and to rebuild the temple of God. To put God first in their thinking. In verse 7, God says this to his people through Haggai. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the mountain so that I may take pleasure in it and be, be honoured. See, God is telling them to repent. To stop thinking about their wealth, their well-being, their comfort, and to put God first. That means going up to the mountain and getting the timber, bringing it down and building the house of God. And to their credit, as, as Haggai brought this news, this, this message from God to Zerubbabel the governor, and to Joshua the high priest, we see they repented and the people repented. If you look through Haggai 1, you look at the time periods between when God gives these different messages to Haggai, you see it's less than a month from getting the first message until the people start building the temple of God again. They hear the word of God and they repent. And so God gives them another message and he says, I am with you. You see, when we repent, when we hear the word of God, when we turn back to God, God wants to remind us that He is with us. He wants to remind us that He loves us. And He wants us to re remind us to encourage us to keep putting Him first in our lives. You see, I think a lot of us face the same temptations as those Jew Jews in Jerusalem in the day of Haggai. You see, what was first in their mind was their wealth, their comfort, their well-being. 
And I think, I think all of us are tempted at times to, to put God second or third in our thinking, put God second or third in our priorities and focus on our, our comfort, to focus on our wealth, to focus on our well-being uh, and not God. And like I said earlier, that's a form of idolatry. That's putting something that isn't God above God in our order of thinking. That's making gods out of something that isn't God. And I think as we read through Haggai 1 today, we're reminded that we need to put God first. Now, now for those in, in Haggai's day, putting God first meant devoting time to build the temple. To remember that God was living with you and making sure that you were honouring God in that way. For, for us, putting God first doesn't mean building a temple for God. So, so what does it look like for us? Well, I think first and foremost, putting God first means we are trusting in Jesus. I think, I think we're putting God first is acknowledging that we are sinful. It's acknowledging that we deserve punishment, but realizing that God has set a saviour for us. God sent Jesus to die and to take that punishment for us. And God rose Jesus from the dead. And we're told that if we repent and put our trust in him, we put him first, God accepts us. He forgives our sins. On a, on a question you and challenge you today, are you putting God first in that way? Have you put your trust in Jesus for yourself? But I think putting God first is more than just trusting in Jesus. It, it's how we live our everyday life. I, I think one of the ways we put God first is, is being intentional and prioritising time with God each day. You see, God's given us his word. He tells us how to live as his people. And he wants us to be spending time with him regularly, daily, time reading and praying. Whether well, that's done uh, as an individual, in a family group, or with, with groups of other Christians. Putting God first means spending time in God's Word. And here at Riverstone Baptist, we want to encourage you to put God first in your life by, by listening to what God says. And one of the ways we do that is we have a daily Bible reading plan. Uh, you contact us if you want a copy of that, or on our, on, on our Facebook, we put up uh, each. Each bit of the Bible we read each day and some thoughts on that. So we want to encourage you to put God first in your lives. Also, we have our family weekly devotions, which we put out once a week. Again, to get us to listen to what God says and put them first in his life. But, but it's no good uh, just to read God's word and not let it impact our life. When we're putting God first, it's got to impact our life. I just want to share some ways that that might look like for some of us. I know a lot of us do put God first and I want this to be an encouragement. But for some of us, maybe this is, is, this is the kind of nudge we need to really think about how we put in God first in our lives. You know, for, for us who are studying, it's, re it's really good to study. It's really good to focus and to learn. But are we doing that at the expense of spending time with God? Are we putting God above our study? Uh, are we looking for ways to find out time to spend with God, but also to, to spend with God's people and to serve God's people? You know, you might go... I could be studying for that hour, or I could be serving in church. I could be sharing good news with other people. Or well, us who are in the workforce. When we get opportunities uh, to, to promote our career, to move up in our jobs, to move sideways in our jobs, do we stop and put God first? Do we bring them to God first and say, is this what you want? Or do we concern ourselves only with the money that we are making and forget about about what that might mean for the way that we can serve our community, how we can bring the love of God to the people around us. Or maybe you're near the end of your working life or you're retired. How do you put God first then? You know, our society tells us, our society tells us that retirement is a time for us to enjoy ourselves and not to think about others. And I think it is good to enjoy the fruits of our labour. But we still need to put God first. Are you using that, that extra time that you have on your hands to, to maybe mentor brothers and sisters in the church? Are you using that time to pray, to study God's word, to think about how I can use the gifts God's given me to share his love with those around me? And as we start to open up and we think about what it looks like to be able to come back together, are we putting God first by prioritising meeting together? You see, one of the ways God wants us to live as his people is to live in community with each other. I know over the next few months, the weather gets more beautiful. 
will have more opportunities to go different places. I encourage you, when you feel safe, to, to, to enjoy God's world that he's given us. But are we also prioritising meeting together to encourage each other, to look to God, to put God first, and to the times when we go against him, to repent, to turn back to God and say, I'm sorry, I want to leave you. I want to remind you what God said to the people of Jerusalem. When they repented and came back to God, he said to him, said to them, I am with you. See, when we put God first, he promises that he is with us. Again, I just want to encourage you, and I know most of you do love putting God first, but some of us need that nudge. How are we putting God first in our lives? Have you join with me, I pray. Dear God, please be our vision, the Lord of our hearts. Not be all else to us, save that you are it. You are our best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, your presence, our light. Now, Father God, help us not to get consumed by our own desires, our own, our own wealth, our own comfort. Help us to not be falling into temptation to, to put them above you. Help us to keep you as number one in our lives. Help that to permeate through every decision and choice that we make. Amen. God bless.